So welcome to Lacrosse Talks. My name is Jim Calder, and I'm with the Canadian Lacrosse Foundation. And uh, we're pleased to be here at uh, the St. Catharines Museum in Welland Canals uh, uh, complex. And uh, we're here specifically because of the Ontario Lacrosse Hall of Fame and uh, the beautiful museum that is here. And uh, we want to bring the history to life. Uh, our guest today is uh, Don Fisher. And uh, Don has a PhD in history from the State University of New York at Buffalo, and he's a professor of history at Niagara County Community College. He's got numerous presentations and publications in the cultural history of lacrosse to his credit, including uh, writing him a, a really important book called a History of the Game. And uh, I use this book as part of my research for a book that I wrote a few years back, a uh, very important book. Uh, and this was published by Johns Hopkins University Press way back in 2002. So um, I first met Don at uh, what was the beginning of uh, uh, creating a, a historical community for lacrosse. And that was out at St. Mary's University at the uh, Transnational Lacrosse Conference a, a few years back. And uh, that was really a, a brilliant uh, time for bringing historians from all over the world together to talk about the history. Uh, we carried this on a little bit in Montreal for the 150th anniversary of lacrosse. Uh, that was uh, June 2017. And uh, Don was uh, there as a lecturer uh, there. When I first met Don, I was expecting to meet this 70 or 80 year old fellow uh, uh, who, uh, because of the knowledge in this book, I go, this guy knows a lot. <laughs> He's been around for a while. And to, to my, uh, my surprise, I met a, a young man who uh, you know, uh, knows so much about the game. And hopefully today you're going to learn a little bit about uh, what uh, uh, he can tell you, which is uh, it comes from a different perspective because Don never uh, played lacrosse himself, but he grew up right near uh, Onondaga Reserve near Syracuse, so right in the heart of the upstate New York lacrosse uh, world and uh, has approached the game more as an academic uh, from the outside versus a player from the, the inside. So uh, that, that has a lot of benefits for us as a, as a community because yeah, it's bringing another perspective to it. So um, I guess uh, my first question would be, why did you write the book, Don? Well, first of all, thank you for having me today. This is a, this is a pleasure for me. Um, well, uh, I, as you mentioned, I'm from the Syracuse area originally, and uh, for graduate school I went to the University of Buffalo, so I'm a lifelong upstate New Yorker, and uh, I've, I've, I've long been interested in, um, to be honest, transnational and native white issues. Growing up next to the Onondaga Reservation, I had a lot of friends from the reservation, and um, when I was in grad school, you're told you have to find an original topic. And I said, why not do something on lacrosse? And it's a great vehicle for examining native white issues. And so I spent several years doing research on it, finished the PhD in 1997. And uh, it's funny that my very first big research trip, I went down to Johns Hopkins. They had a big uh, event on campus. And I met the author of this book, his name is Tom Venom. Uh, Tom Venom was an anthropologist, eth ethnomusicologist, and he wrote this book on, um, on the, the early modern game. And uh, so I got talking to him at this event, and I said, hey, Mr. Venom, this is a great pleasure to meet you. I didn't know this book was in the works. Uh, do you know anyone else who's doing similar research? And he said, well, it's just you and me. <laughs> We're the only ones doing this. So, okay, we have, a, we have a fraternity of two. <laughs> and uh, anyways, so he invited me to stay at his house when I was doing research in D.C. Uh, I did a lot of work at the National Archives Library of Congress. And so I stayed with him for a couple of days, and I got to see this phenomenal collection of old sticks, uh, traditional sticks dating back to the 19th century. And so anyways, I, I finished the degree in 97, sat on it for a few years, and then published it as a book in 2002. Um, I, I should tell everyone that, as, as Jim said, I, I never played. I don't come at this from the point of view of a player or as a coach. I was more interested in what this sport told us in terms of broader issues. And I, I, was, 
I was fascinated by this, this theme that it just kept hitting me. If there's any phrase I would use to describe the history of this sport, it is a contested ground. And I, I mean that in two ways. Obviously, lacrosse is a physical game where you're fighting over the ball. That's, that's obvious. But what intrigued me in looking at the history of the sport, uh, whether it's in Maryland or upstate New York or British Columbia or Six Nations, Peterborough, Toronto, New England prep schools, Long Island, no matter where I looked, I kept finding these constant fights for control of the game. And this, this dates back to the mid-19th century. Uh, and it's a long list of people fighting over the meaning of the game, whether it's, whether it's uh, Canadian nationalists or urban boosters trying to promote people to move to their city, um, professionals, amateur purists. Uh, more recently, monster truck promoters have gotten involved in it. They formed the major indoor lacrosse league. Uh, a lot of you know, intercollegiate associations, native traditionalists, native modernists, people seeking to create a sense of native sovereignty through sport. Just so many people fighting over the meaning of the game. And my book, most of it covers the most recent century and a half. And that was a, a theme I kept finding over and over again. And that became the, the overarching um, tale, I guess you could say. Yes, and uh, you, your book d does cover a lot from the 1860s, but you also provide a pretty panoramic history of the ancient forms of, of lacrosse. Uh, I know you've done more work in this area. Uh, this is an area that intrigues you? It, it does, yeah. Um, everyone alive today, everyone alive the past hundred years who likes lacrosse will have, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll have some very, very brief knowledge, very limited knowledge of what the game might have looked like, say, 300 years ago, 400 years ago. And I wanted to make sure that in doing this history, it didn't start in the 1860s. It didn't start with this uh, dentist, Dr. George Beers. There's a, a much deeper, I find really fascinating history dating back, from my point of view, 500 years, maybe even 600 years. And so uh, I've spent a lot of time surveying what other scholars had said. And you know, Tom Venom, who's actually done two books, uh, he was the second of the scholars that's really tackled this. The first one was a guy named Stuart Cullen, which is early 20th century. Cullen and, and uh, Venom are both, they both have anthropology backgrounds. And what was interesting about Cullen is he, he outlined that uh, when he surveyed uh, Eastern North America, he, he argued that there were three different types of games being played by native people. Uh, what he called racket, which is uh, a game where you scoop the ball and run with it. That became lacrosse. Uh, a game named shinny, which is, looks like uh, modern field, field hockey. And then a game called chunky, where you throw a stick at, a, at a, a rock that's thrown in the distance. So he outlined these three different types of games. And then Venom comes along in the 1990s and begins to understand that within the racket game, there were these regional types. Uh, and you can see it in terms of the sticks being used. Uh, there's a cluster of games being played in the Eastern Great Lakes region. There's a cluster in the Western Great Lakes, and then another cluster in the Southeast. Imagine you know, Mississippi, Alabama, the Carolinas. And what I've done is I've gone back and looked at all of that, all, all of that other evidence. Some of it's documentary, some of it's linguistic, some of it's oral traditions, native folklore, um, some of it's physical. And what I've done is I've, I've, I've examined the, this very same evidence, but looking at it through the prism of a historian. So I'm looking for much deeper questions. And I've, I've often stressed that uh, whenever I talk about this, that you can't talk about the history of native ball games without acknowledging what was going on here before Europeans arrived. I think many people today, uh, native and not native alike perhaps, who imagine that history before Europeans arrived is rather static, and that couldn't be more wrong. So if you want to really understand the, the, the story of lacrosse and its, and, its, uh, and its origins, I would go back a thousand years. And if you look at North America about a thousand years ago, it's very warm, the planet's very warm. It's what climate scholars call the medieval anomaly. 
from around uh, about 950 until around 1250, our planet's very warm. And corn began spreading from Mexico uh, up through North America, up through what we now call the Mississippian River drainage system. So if you can imagine the Mississippi River and all the rivers that feed into it, you have corn spreading. And eventually, some of these folks who lived here began building large towns, burial mounds. Uh, my wife and I, a few years ago, got to visit. Uh, there's a, a, an archaeological site being rebuilt called Cahokia. It's near St. Louis. And there's evidence there of a ball field where they played chunky. Okay? So what I'm stressing here is there's a massive population boom around 1,000 years ago. And these people are playing games. We don't really know much about them, but we know they're playing stick games. And then something dramatic happens beginning around the year 1300, which is well before Europeans arrived. The planet starts cooling off. The whole planet starts cooling off. Uh, scholars have nicknamed this the, the Little Ice Age. And it goes up until around the middle of the 19th century. Now, why am I, why am I going off on this issue of climate? Well, as the planet cools off, all these native communities relying heavily on farming, corn, beans, squash, they, they're, they're having crop failures. And all these big urban towns will be abandoned eventually. People are moving away from lake fronts, they're moving away from river fronts, and they begin moving inland toward the higher ground, deep into the forest. They have to retreat, they have to abandon this, this early civilization. And eventually those old native towns are forgotten. Their uh, foliage grows over them. They're buried by time. Um, and so what happens is these people by the 1400s are now living in smaller communities and they're, f and they're fighting over resources in the forest. And so what's the connection between this big story and La Crosse? Very simple. Uh, each town is fighting over usage of, the, of hunting grounds. And eventually, that turns to bloody warfare. Now, if you look at the kind of warfare being fought at this time, it's, uh, it's all hand-to-hand -hand combat, using clubs. And Tom Venom points out that it's, it's absolutely fascinating that the earliest lacrosse sticks resemble these clubs. So the kind of fighting going on is very much hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, there's a, there's a few peoples in the Northeast who begin to recognize that we have, a lot to, we have a lot in common, we should stop fighting each other. And that's right here in uh, the Northeast. The Iroquois people lay aside their differences and they form a massive alliance. The people of the Longhouse. Uh, you know, we know them in the Mohawk in the East through the Seneca in the, in the West. And they put aside their differences and they start using these ball games for other purposes, reinforcing alliance ties. So these are the kind of issues that I, I found really fascinating. And historians of lacrosse or fans of lacrosse are, are really unaware of all this backstory, completely unaware of it. We, we tend to look at the history of lacrosse looking for a single starting point. I don't think there is one. And I think we're only beginning to understand where lacrosse really came from. Yeah, and they, uh, they played these clan games. Uh, so you could be uh, near Montreal, uh, Akwesasne or Ganawagi, Ganasataki, and uh, be Wolf Clan uh, there. You could also be Wolf Clan all the way out with the Seneca near Buffalo. And every once in a while, in order to strengthen ties between the Iroquois or the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, uh, they'd play a clan game. So it could be Wolf Clan. And everyone from Montreal to Buffalo who was Wolf Clan played on the same team. And uh, you could be playing the turtle clan or, you know, or the deer clan or, or the, you know, there's 12 clans. And uh, that's how they, it was brilliant because it, it strengthened the ties for the Confederacy in general. It broke down uh, the differences between Onondaga, Cayuga, and uh, uh, Seneca, and, and, and uh, Oneida, and Mohawk, and uh, made them a, a tighter unit. And there was a lot of uh, pressure coming from uh, Euro European uh, uh, yeah. growth rates. So the clan game was a really important game. And when the Europeans arrive, French, English, they're going to introduce a whole series of other developments which begin affecting the game in profound ways. Everything from uh, the, the the fight for conquering Indian land, but also the introduction of European material culture. If you look at all the lacrosse sticks, 
from the 19th century, or even today, the traditional sticks, they're made with iron tools. Iron tools weren't available 500 years ago. So what, what did the sticks look like 500 years ago? We don't know. Uh, I'd love to have a conversation with, a, with, a, with someone who could kind of reverse engineer the 19th century sticks that were made with iron tools. Uh, it'd be a fascinating topic. Yeah, one of the oldest paintings is there's one in Italy uh, where uh, there's a canoe. Uh, back in the 1400s, this painting was done. And they have a great lake stick in the, yeah. in the canoe. Was that made with iron or was that made uh, you know, just by hand? You know, that, so none of those sticks uh, exist anymore. Probably the oldest sticks now are in the 1830s. Uh, right, right. Uh, Alfie Jacks, a great stick maker from Onondaga, was telling me the story where he was finally introduced in Philadelphia to uh, a stick that's called the Cayuga stick, uh, which is one of the most beautiful sticks and one of the oldest sticks still around today. Uh, the carvings on it are incredible, and uh, they don't let people see this stick because it's uh, you know it's so delicate, and uh, uh, they let Alfie uh, spend about an hour with it, and uh, he said it was like one of the greatest moments Absolutely. of his life to see that stick and the craftsmanship in it. So it's a window into the past. Yeah, that's right. And if that's the 1830s, can you imagine what did those sticks look like in the 1630s or the 1430s? Well, of course, we'll never know. Yeah, with, with the Haudenosaunee, everything was meant to, to go back uh, into the earth. So it started from the earth. Uh, you know, the hickory, that's sacred wood for the, the sticks, uh, is hickory grown in North America, you know, whether it's Canada or the U.S. Uh, and the, the animal uh, leather that was used within the sticks, whether it was groundhog, was a great pocket, or deer uh, skin, uh, you know, that came from the animals from here. And that's why George Beers in the 1860s thought that this was the game that should represent us. He, they didn't want cricket to be our national game. They, he was a nationalist, you know, that was foisted upon us by, you know, Great Britain. They wanted a game that came from our very, very land. And, you know, Beers' position of growing up in Montreal, taking this trip across the St. Lawrence, which I've been on both sides there and looked both ways, and that was not an easy no. uh, trip without that bridge that exists today to get across there. So Beers obviously wanted to know more about this from an early age. Uh, and I know British royalty visited in the 1860s, and Beers was introduced to the Prince Albert, I think, uh, in 1861. I think that had a long-lasting effect on him uh, and wanting to move the game forward, plus his relationships with the, the Ganawagi Mohawk. Uh, and the fact that George uh, Beers wanted to really make the game the national game of Canada is interesting because that's only two years after the American Civil War just ended. So can you imagine how do Canadians feel in the late 60s knowing that this big violent episode just happened to their south? Uh, I know a lot of Canadians enlisted in the U.S., uh, the Northern Federal Army, but it no doubt had an impact in instilling a sense that maybe we should identify who we are. And one way of doing that is through national institutions like inventing a national sport like lacrosse. Yeah, and, and Beers was such a nationalist, he created this lacrosse team. The Hotch it started out as the Hachalega lacrosse team, then morphed into the Montreal Lacrosse Club. Uh, but it, uh, he actually, right around the Civil War, they were worried about the Fenian raids coming up to uh, yeah. Canada. Uh, he, he used those same players from that lacrosse team that formed the first Victoria Rifles. Uh, of Montreal, so everything had a, a reason, <laughs> you know, forming groups yeah. uh, and using them for reason. There, and there was a real fear of uh, Canada being overtaken. It's through those funny you mentioned the Irish, the Irish, the, the, the Fenian uh, episode. That you know, within within a couple decades of this national game being created, you have a virtual professional Irish team in Montreal becoming the dominant team of the, the East. Shamrocks. The Shamrocks, yeah. yeah. And interesting, out of that, one of their key players uh, uh, ended up going down to the United States. Uh, went to Boston first, and Flannery, uh, John Flannery. John Flannery, and yeah. he was he was uh, uh, he was picked up by, by Standard Oil, and Boston paid for him to come. And then he grew the game uh, from Boston to New York to to uh, Baltimore. And he, again, he was an, uh, a shamrock. Uh, for yeah, uh, actually, yes. Yeah, Fascinating how Canadian immigrants really are the ones who build the early game in the States. And obviously the, obviously the United States has served as a, a magnet for a lot of Canadians to 
for economic opportunities, and that's how lacrosse got to the U.S. Yeah, it became, you know, uh, there were a lot of games being played in the heart of New York City, like Central Park. Uh, there, there, uh, I believe uh, it was the Haudenosaunee and the Blackfeet played a, a game in Central Park uh, in the early days, and this drew great attention to the, to the game. They, when they played on Boston Commons, uh, estimates of up to 20,000 people came out to see that game uh, when Flannery put that on in Boston Commons. So, uh, it was, again, there was this partnership between First Nations and also the club entrepreneurs, club owners, to work together to build the game. And it wasn't always fair, uh, the relationship, but it was a relationship that ended up the, with the game being brought over to Europe, uh, 1867, 76, and 83, uh, through those trips that yep. took place. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about uh, that, that era, I guess. Uh, late uh, 19th century? Yeah, the late 1860s onward kind of thing. Um, sh sure. In terms of a major turning point, is that what you wanted to... Yeah, and just how the game spread through, the, you know, those relationships. And, yeah, yeah um, Jim and I have been talking quite a bit over the last couple of years about all sorts of uh, topics. And one of the things that, that has intrigued me is this whole question of, you know, looking at the modern game, um, are there moments when you have really important turning points? And Jim just brought up the issue of what's going on in the late 19th century. Uh, yeah, within, within 10 years, You've got people who are lacrosse partisans who are traveling to England, Australia, New York City, Baltimore, uh, all throughout New England, and they're, it's like they're colonizing the game, which, uh, which says a lot about how Canadians feel about being uh, an active player in the British Empire. I mean, you know, we're, we're not just passive members of the empire. We want to have a voice, and they're using lacrosse as a way of doing that. Yeah, and then it spread to New Zealand, had lacrosse in the early 1880s, and Australia, um, South Africa had lacrosse. It went, it went all through the British Empire. Um, and um, I, I guess there was one, uh, one little fun fact. Uh, there were, Orangeville played a, a big role early on. Uh, a, a couple of fellows were involved in the mining in industry. One went to San Francisco in the 1870s, and one went to Australia in the late 18, 1870s or early 1880s, and they brought the sticks with them and got the games going uh, in those two places, which were pretty far away from uh, Orangeville, Ontario. <laughs> you know, so yeah, it was amazing how it it it, it kind of just took off for a while there. Yeah. They had big crowds at the the different places where it yeah. was played. Yeah, so um, 1860s, uh, it was used you know, as a national sport. When they traveled over to, uh, to Great Britain, uh, the first trip was kind of on the Montreal Lacrosse Club. Uh, they paid for it, it didn't work out that well. But 1876, 1883, Government of Canada started seeing this as a real benefit to use the game uh, to help draw uh, immigrants to Canada. And so they brought with them like 300,000 flyers and distributed them. They'd play, um, 50 games in 30 days, all through uh, Wales, Scotland, uh, and England, and distribute uh, these flyers. Uh, it was a partnership between the Ganawagi Akwesasne uh, Mohawk and the Montreal Lacrosse Club and other lacrosse clubs that went over there and put on these performances. And uh, 1883, uh, the, you know, you see the, it, it was really well developed as a, a promotional tool for the, for the country. What's funny about that, though, is you've got, you've got this effort by the Canadian establishment to use the game to promote migration. Yeah. But back in Canada, whether it's Montreal, Toronto, or other cities, the game is quickly evolving into a quasi-professional circuit where entrepreneurs are re realizing that they can get 5,000 people to come to a game that they can make money. And so gamblers get involved and uh, players moving from one club to another, jumping because of money being paid under the table. So it's Intriguing that while uh, the government of Canada is using the sport to promote migration, other people are doing other things with it. Uh, they're embracing the commercial world. And of course, the same story is in every sport, whether it's baseball or basketball or football. It's that same, uh, the lure of the dollars, which, uh, well, it's, it's part of our world today. Yeah, I, I've seen images from uh, Winnipeg and Regina yeah. and, and certainly uh, New Westminster, British Columbia, the Salmon Bellies, 
uh, late 1890s, early 1900s of huge crowds uh, at those field games back then. And they were being used as a, a money maker for, yeah. for local entrepreneurs who were, who were paying for those games to happen. And that entrepreneurship, you know, things started to happen to the game with World War I uh, had part of the effect on it. Kind of maybe take people through how it, the decline and then the, the way it went. Yeah, by the, by the era of World War I, you have an interleague war going on basically in eastern Canada, and that wound up killing the sport in a lot of ways. It survived in, throughout the 20s. But um, by, the end of the, by the end of the 20s and the beginning of the Great Depression, field lacrosse was in rough shape in Canada. And so one of the other interesting turning points in the history of the sport is the early Great Depression period. Uh, the Canadians decided to embrace this, this uh, box lacrosse, which interestingly was invented by the Montreal Canadiens hockey team. Uh, they decided to create a, uh, an indoor game to sell tickets during the summer, and they put together a professional league, uh, just a four or five clubs, and uh, didn't go very far. But it was successful enough that it inspired the amateur groups in Ontario and British Columbia to say, let's switch. So within a year, they just everybody switches to box lacrosse. But again, what's interesting is it started by an NHL club. Uh, hockey people invented box lacrosse, but then the amateur said, let's just run with this. So it, it was in part as a way of saving money. So now you could have a smaller field, smaller rosters. Uh, instead of having 12 guys in the field, you can have only seven. And by the 50s, it drops down to six. Uh, and meanwhile, the Americans, uh, the colleges, universities have their own debate, and they decide to reaffirm the game that beers made, but now cut the roster from for the, the, the on-field squad from 12 down to 10. And they made some other changes as far as the boundary lines, uh, but basically they kept intact the game that Beers had created. So the irony is the American colleges are now playing the game that Beers wanted, and the Canadians are playing the game that the NHL created, essentially. <laughs> uh, and that'll go on for quite a long time, and uh, what I've said in the past is that from that moment, from the early 30s onward, the American and Canadian lacrosse communities start really to go their own separate ways. And they don't really start reconnecting in a meaningful way, not probably until the late 1960s. And then as we get into the 60s, there's early attempts at, at real pro leagues starting, right? Maybe. Uh, yeah, there, there had been other professional leagues started, but they would last a year and then just fall apart. The late 60s is really critical because it's not just um, it's not just a Canadian lacrosse league starting for a couple of years, but there's so many other interesting things going on. You know, for instance, there was a crisis in terms of available sticks for players, and there was only a limited number of craftsmen who could make sticks. And so someone gets the idea, well, why, not we, why don't we start making lacrosse stick heads made of synthetic materials, basically plastic. And so ironically, by embracing this synthetic lacrosse stick head, it leads to the chance for the game to explode. See, for a long time, for 100 years, you could only grow the sport so much because of the limited production capabilities of craftsmen on reservations. That's the great irony of this. And of course, once people switch to plastic uh, here and down in the States, the numbers of people playing starts to really go way up. So in that sense, you could say that really hurt native craftsmen. But Interestingly, the more people who play, there's actually a market now for more people interested in buying wooden sticks. So in the, in the next several decades, you're going to see people who like lacrosse, whether it's U.S. or Canada, who will say, you know, I would like to get my hands on a wood stick. So now there's actually more opportunities for a stick maker. Yeah, it's interesting here at the Ontario Lacrosse Hall of Fame, there's a, a mold uh, in the museum. Uh, from the 1960s. That was like the first attempt at creating the plastic stick. And uh, yeah, you can see that right, right here in uh, St. Catharines. Uh, and part of that was out of necessity. There had been a fire on one of the, the stick making factories. And so out of necessity, someone says, why not uh, create something from a synthetic material? Um, it's funny, uh, many years ago I was watching, ever, ever seen the movie The Graduate? Where it starts off uh, where the Dustin Hoffman characters just finished college and he's talking with 
this uh, older gentleman, and he says, you should go into plastic. Plastic is the future. Well, plastic is crucial for the growth of lacrosse, interestingly. And obviously, look where we are today. But, but besides that, though, you have the World Games starting in 67. Yeah. You've got the NCAA creating a tournament beginning in 71. And that is a really fascinating moment, late 60s, early 70s, where the sport is going through a massive change. It starts to really take off. Well, I remember as a player uh, having wood up till uh, you know 1971, and then the first plastic came out, and within one year, everybody was playing yeah. with plastic. It was that quick, uh, the change from wood to plastic. Down, uh, I was Canadian growing up down in the U.S., and it went th that fast. And I think the stat that they always used was in the NCAA championship game in 71, it was all wood, and uh, by 1972, it was 95% plastic. Yeah. Uh, it went, that's how quick uh, things evolved down there with, with the plastic stick. Um, yeah, well, you talk about the World Games. And uh, 67, I think it was the 100th anniversary of the modern game with Beer's yeah. Rules. So somebody had the idea as part of our, our centennial here in Canada to put on a lacrosse tournament. And uh, I think it was played, if, if I'm not wrong, in about four or five Ontario cities. It was rotated around. Uh, and Peterborough being one of those, and uh, probably Brampton. And, you know, but interestingly, they're, they're playing field lacrosse. Yes, because uh, England and Australia, Australia. And, yeah. and the U.S. Uh, were field. So uh, our Canadian players had to put down, uh, well, maybe use their box sticks yeah, at that yeah. time uh, in the field game. Yeah. And, uh, but that got things going, and then it took seven years until 1974, Australia decided to host the next one, and it became a real thing uh, with right. that 74 event down in Australia. And, uh, you know, that kept it going. So by that point, you now have the beginnings of meaningful connections again between Canada and the U.S., the two communities. And then within a few more years, as you, you could probably talk much more about this than I could, but how many Canadian young men are going to start getting offers from American schools to come down and play lacrosse? That's whether right. it's Mike French or later on the Gate Brothers, uh, that will reinforce that emerging connection between the two countries that had been severed for several decades. Yeah, and it, it, the reality of the story is that the best lacrosse player is a blend of box and field, and yeah. uh, now the U.S. is one of the biggest promoters of box lacrosse. <laughs> you know, as we move through time, you know, it's really interesting to see how everything moves around like that. Well, as we get. Through into the 2010s, more stuff happens, and I think it's even fascinating. We're living through some things that are right to the minute uh, at the moment. And, yeah, uh, I, uh, I I read something many years ago by you know, the p political columnist um, George Will, who was a big baseball fan, and he made the comment that he found it odd that people would talk about baseball's golden age being in the 1950s, and he said, "Well." Baseball's golden age is the present, meaning the last 20 years. Uh, and he went on to explain why he felt that way. And he, I don't think he was wrong. Uh, and I look at today, and does lacrosse have a golden age? Maybe we're living through it, because there's so much going on now. The number of countries playing is, is just growing into, into the dozens of them. Um, the Iroquois Confederacy now has a team that's been playing in these international tournaments, and they're winning silver and bronze medals. Uh, that was unthinkable back in the 1970s. The only sport that I know of in the world in, the, in team competition that allows an indigenous population to compete as a country is lacrosse. And they've done very well for themselves. So in that sense, the, the world we live in today is giving an incredible platform for Native people that they didn't have 30 years ago. Right, I, I think uh, in Israel this past summer, they, I think it was 46 or 48 countries competing, but beyond that, there's about 60 countries playing the game, which is unheard of, including three in Africa. You know, which, uh, a few years ago, the Onondaga, was, they were the host country for the World Indoor Games. That's they, built a new, they, they, yeah. they built new facilities uh, to host, uh, host these games, spending millions of dollars on this. This, was, yeah. this, this is unthinkable 30 years ago that this, this would have happened. Yeah, and from what I understand from uh, speaking with members of the FIL, and uh, 
we're probably, you know, within 10 years or so of us being back in the Olympics. Uh, we were in the Olympic sport in 1904 and 1908, I think. Mm -hmm. And then some dem demonstration sports in the, at a few different Olympics, like 32. I think then 1948 might have been the last one. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, there was something played in Los, Los Angeles, Angeles in 1980 80 or so. Yeah, yep, 84. Yeah. Yep. yeah, was it 84? Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, so we're well on our way to you know making an impact at the world level. Who knows what that game will look like at the Olympics? Again, they'll want it to uh, fit kind of a an X Games kind of look that the Olympics is yeah. going to to keep younger <laughs> viewers involved. So it might be a different. Might be a blend of the two games, you know, or something like that nature. Um, you know, you you mentioned to me, uh, Don, that there's a clash between traditionalists and uh, uh, newer enthusiasts. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, you know, um, doing my research, whether talking to Canadians or Americans or Iroquois people, I will often hear this idea that lacrosse is growing. This is a good thing. We want to grow the game, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, as the game gets really big, it becomes a lot more commercial, and it starts looking a lot more like other sports. And it's, it speaks to the issue of be careful what you wish for. Uh, if something gets too big and too commercial, things which you, which you associate with other larger commercial enterprises start to creep into lacrosse. And I think a lot of tradition-minded people Native or non-native are a bit troubled by this. Well, lacrosse, lacrosse is the only uh, spiritual team game in the world, and and that's always been something that has made it different than any other sport. And there's a fear that could be lost. Uh, that, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's important for that part of the game to to move forward as it grows in every other way. Now you you mentioned something like right up to the minute there's something happening right now with uh, the direction of yeah, the commerce um, of the game. Where we are right now at the professional level, there's there's obviously there's a national lacrosse league which in one form or another has been around since the late 1980s. It's got professional teams, well, it went in Buffalo, Saskatoon, new teams in San Diego, Philadelphia, you know, pretty sizable cities. Halifax. Halifax <laughs> is going to be coming on next year. And some of these teams are owned by billionaires. Not millionaires, billionaires. Comcast owns the Philadelphia Wings. The Mohegan um, the Casino owns the New England Black Wolves. Uh, the Buffalo Sabres owner owns the Bandits. There's a billionaire who owns the San Diego Seals team. The Vancouver Canucks just purchased the Vancouver Stealth. So this is huge money. Outdoors, there's a major league lacrosse. Um, they have smaller crowds, but they've got a lot of exposure on television. And in the past week or so, it was just announced that some of the star players have formed their own league, the Premier Lacrosse League. And they're luring away all the talent from the other major league lacrosse. And so we have, a, we have an interleague war on the horizon that'll start, well, now. <laughs> and lacrosse has had a long history of interleague wars. Canada in the 19 teens, um, you know, back in the back in the late 19 uh, or late 1990s, there was a the, the mill and the NLL were fighting, and then they produced a merger. So we are seeing another another trend recapitulate. It's, it's the same story, but new people involved. Now there's a major player by the name of Paul Rabel who's very involved in that whole yeah. uh, thing, right? And he's got a lot of uh, Wall Street money lined up behind his effort. So we'll see how it plays out. Yeah. Who would have thought, uh, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago that it would be at this uh, level and ready to take the next step, I guess? <laughs> the opening line of my book, I, I take you back to a uh, lunch table when I'm in high school. Lacrosse was, was very big in my high school. Uh, every spring, it was the king. And I, I had someone who I knew said, uh, was, if, if, uh, if there was a lacrosse major league, it'd be, it'd be great. And of course, there was none. Um, and look where we are today. Yeah, now there's a lot of opportunity. And Buffalo Bandits, indoor lacrosse, routinely 15,000 people a game. 15,000 a game. That's been going on for a quarter century. 
Yeah, Saskatoon is doing really well. Yeah, the rush. Okay. They they yeah. uh, they've been leading the league in attendance. Yeah, sixteen thousand maybe a game. Yeah, I don't know the numbers offhand, but pretty big crowds. Yeah. Um, Don, we're we're getting near the end of our our formal time. Uh, is there anything else you want to add right now uh, to the story? Or um, I ha I do have other projects in the pipeline, but. Um, I'm a pretty busy guy, so I'm not able to work on them at the moment, but I, I do plan on doing more work and writing some more. Um, if you'd like to give people a chance to ask questions. Yeah, we wanted to open it up uh, to the floor for questions for Don or myself or both of us and uh, see if we can get you an answer if you have a question that you're thinking of here. Well, thank you very much for that very enlightening talk, and uh, we really appreciate all the work you've done in bringing this game to us from a historical perspective. Um, a lot of stuff I did not know, and I'd love to read your book and, and the other books, too. Uh, my question is, uh, I've played lacrosse starting when I was five years old, and I'm still playing. I'm 66, playing Masters lacrosse. I've coached and played with and against Native players, and we've worked together or um, ostensibly happily against each other uh, for those years, and it's only until a recent past that I've heard anything about cultural appropriation of the game. Um, in fact, I was at a talk at Brock University a while ago, and it was a white researcher who brought up the idea that we had appropriated the game. And it was interesting that a professor I worked with, a uh, native professor, he and I sort of looked at each other and we smiled, thinking that we'd played against each other and we enjoyed the game together. But I had not heard this before. I wonder, is that an issue today? Well, is it an issue for younger people? Is that you're asking for players? I'm not, my, my sense is they may not be really aware of that as an issue. I, I don't know. I couldn't tell you. But from the very beginning of the modern sport, it is an obvious appropriation, an adoption of a native tradition by white, Anglo, Canadian, middle class athletes. And that's what Beers was. I'd never heard that from any native people before. Again, it was somebody outside of the game that brought it to my attention, and I thought about it. So our, I'm just wondering if people in the Native community look at us as um, equal in terms of our appreciation for the game. I, th I think you would get probably a, a variety of answers, to be honest. Yeah. I think some people would uh, express the, the one viewpoint that this was theft, uh, manipulation, transformation, and it speak about it in that sense. Others might say, well, uh, these 19th century Canadians took our game and uh, it's a great example of how something native is now on a world stage. If you look at North America, how many forms of indigenous culture do you find on such a large, on such a large stage? Uh, how many forms of Apache or uh, Lakota or Cherokee culture do you see on a world stage? And uh, the Iroquois have lacrosse. And that, I think that speaks to the positive part of it. Yeah, and I would also say that uh, with everything in history, it's easy to look back and uh, look through hindsight because it's 2020. Um, but the positive side in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, 80s, was lacrosse became a meeting ground for people that may not have uh, come in contact with each other. It became a, a way uh, for groups to, to meet and, and enjoy something together, uh, another way of doing that besides commerce. And, and the game was used uh, in that manner as well. There's positives. And let's negative. not forget, it was not an even playing field. Because every one of the things I talk about in the book is if you look at every time people adopt rules, there's a, there's an agenda there, and if you look at, for example, the way sticks are made, and the, the, look at the rules that George Beers comes up with, it's obvious. I mean, he even says it in the language. He wants to make a game where it's very much about passing, and if you look at the traditional ball games of Native people, it was about running. It was a scooping game, it was a carrying game, it was a running game. Deeper pocket. Uh, you're right. And so the, the new sticks being designed and made in the 1860s, 70s, 80s, uh, it's, it's obvious it's about now passing. And I think Beers even comments, well, if, it, if we play the old way, then, then white athletes can't keep up with you. So what we're going to do is we're going to change the stick designs yeah. to make it so we can, we can catch up to where you guys are. You guys are the better runners, 
So if we have more passing, it'll make it easier for us to be competitive. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, whenever you see a rule adopted, this is true in any sport, any, any time period. Whenever you see a rule being adopted, there's an agenda there. There's a statement being made that we either support or we oppose something. Uh, that's true in the NFL, NBA, any sport. It's true in lacrosse. Yeah. And for a long time uh, in Canada, you, know, you, you couldn't be a professional and be recognized as part of the athletic community. Well, that was a way of making sure that natives who were playing as ringers would be ostracized, but under the guise of getting rid of professionals. Uh, read between the lines. It was about kicking Indians out of, <coughs> off the teams. That's yeah. what it was about. Yeah. And then at the same time, though, uh, Don, there was the, the trips over to Great Britain were partnerships. Sure, you, sure. You know what I mean? So. Again, it's not all one way or the other. No, it's not. No, it's not. Yeah, things, but uh, I, I would say that, uh, you, you know, there, it, for the longest time it became difficult for First Nations to play in the game. You had to have an equal number of First Nations on each team. That was one of the rules. You know, you had to agree upon that side, and that's because they were better at it, you know, and uh, it was, uh, I think, born out of that necessity. Society as a whole was not uh, in, in its best uh, light at that period, and the lacrosse was just another example of where uh, differences were played out uh, in, in yep. that, you know. Any other uh, questions on that? Originally, the game of lacrosse was uh, a battle between two nations, Indian nations that they, they actually settled their differences in the game of lacrosse. That, that's an image you'll hear among, among uh, some writers. Uh, my, own, my own take is I don't think we'll ever really fully understand what the game meant 300 years ago or 400 years ago. Uh, I would argue we only have very really sketchy evidence. So making that claim, you hear that a lot nowadays, um, it's, it's, it's guesswork. Uh, are there games? Are there games played involving dozens, hundreds? Yes, uh, but is that is that the normal game being played? Not not at all. I, I suspect that the average game being played anywhere in North America, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 400 years ago, is a lot smaller in scale. And as a, as a battle, um, maybe it's a way of resolving a, a dispute. But I wouldn't call it a battle, though. Yeah. So, sometimes you're going to see uh, white commentators kind of mythologize these paintings or these descriptions, and they're going to see it what they want to see. And yeah. I think it's a mistake to say that it's, you know, it's a big battle. You know, I thought I read somewhere that people were actually, the Indians were actually killed playing the game. I, I think that's probably another example of uh, exaggeration, to put it mildly, yeah. Why would you want to play a game where you get killed? <laughs> well, you know, fair enough. I made, the, I made the comment earlier about what was going on in North America prior to Europeans arriving. And I'll take it back to the context. The, the planet's uh, cooling off, crop failures, people are, people are moving away from the big towns, moving inland. You do see actual fighting going on uh, between different towns over hunting lands. But the kind of warfare you see is all about hand-to-hand -hand combat. And interestingly, you want to minimize the loss of life. If you have a town of 200 people, one of the objectives, interestingly, is, is what's called, well, adoption. You capture people, you bring them back to your town, you run them through the gauntlet, and maybe you offer them the chance to join your, your town. That was not uncommon. That was, a one, that was one way of replacing your own dead. Um, the game is being played in many of these towns would be one way of kind of, for lack of a better way of saying it, honing your, your combat skills. The stick, the war club, are, they, they look very similar, and you want to you wanna use that stick to capture someone, not to kill them. This isn't, these are not wars of genocide. These are wars of establishing control over a forest or establishing control over people. It's not about killing people. Yeah. Do people get killed? Absolutely. But that's not the objective, though. Yeah, well, you know, what, can I add, just add to that, all right? Um, this game's a medicine game at its very root, all right? And the game 
uh, I, I've been taught by faith keepers uh, about the essence of the game and where it comes from. It was used maybe as little brother of war 5% of the time to get ready for the war path because of the fitness and the organization that it required, but that was a small part of it. The bigger part of it was this game was played uh, to heal someone in the tribe who was ill. They'd play a game for that person, give them the ball at the end, uh, whether it was psychosomatic or whatever. The person knew that the entire community was behind them, uh, and maybe that helped put them in a, a positive uh, movement forward. They, they used it instead of fighting for, for uh, hunting grounds, as Donna said. It was used that uh, they felt that the, they played for the entertainment of the creator. And they felt the creator would choose who was supposed to win that game and who would win the hunting grounds for a year. Uh, it, you know, so it was used in that, in that manner as a medicine game first. It came, there's an entity uh, that they call the grandfather, uh, Hadoui, and it, it came under his, his uh, oversight. Uh, and uh, even the hickory that's used in the sticks by the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois, was a sacred wood that came uh, underneath uh, uh, Hadoui. Um, so there was a lot of tie-ins with the medicine side of it. Uh, not the, the the warfare killing side of it, so it, it's a medicine game first. Yeah, part of the part of the problem we have today is you know, we we know that's a very important part of it as understood by people today. What we don't know and nobody knows is what was being said 300 years ago. Right, right. No, no, no we one knows there. that. <laughs> no one alive here today knows the answer to that question. I don't know that answer. So uh, it's it's difficult to say. You know what what role does does uh, War preparation play, what role is the medicine, what role in terms of, because gambling was very big, yeah. redistributing materials in a tribe, we have no idea what, uh, what role percentage-wise the game pl would have played 300, 400, 500 years ago. It, 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 it is guesswork. It's an educated guesswork, though, I, w I would say. Yes? Do we have so little... Uh recorded anything about the game that long ago because the Hurons didn't play lacrosse? Because uh, surely the We have so little evidence. I, I mentioned earlier there's different types of evidence that we have, whether it's native folklore, which you have to be careful how you interpret that. The linguistic evidence is there. Native names for the games, a lot of it's about confrontation. A lot of it's about combat. So that's an obvious direct directness with, uh, with war. Um, we have the physical evidence, whether it's sticks or photographs, old photographs and materials. And we also have um, um, oral, oral traditions, physical evidence, linguistic. We, we have, it's not very much though is my point. And so we, we have to be very careful on what we, how much we draw from that. Yeah, yeah, but they, there but was the, no, the no, Hurons had the French brothers with them who sent Home written reports about everything that happened. Jesuit the, relations. Yeah. 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 The Iroquois, of course, did not have them. <laughs> did they not have an equivalent? With, or were the... Uh, well, when the, French, when the French come down the St. Lawrence River Valley, or up the valley, I should say, they will uh, establish a presence in what is now southern Ontario. And, of course, the Huron, that's their home world. Uh, the Iroquois are across the lake. And uh, they're on the, the, the margins of the French presence. Uh, Iroquois connections with the Dutch, with the English and the French is, it's kind of an interesting story, which we're not going to go into, but they, they maintain a stronger sense of independence than the, the, the Huron do. And of course, with disease becoming an issue, the, the Huron are just decimated. Uh, so we'll never know, you know how that would have played out if you know, disease wasn't really an issue. And there's no record in the the Jesuit archives in wherever they're in Europe. The, the Jesuits do comment on seeing games. They do. So there is that. Oh, absolutely. That, yes. it, that, so that's 1500, 1600. Uh, six, I don't know. The 1637. Six, 16, yeah. Bray, Brayboof uh, wrote back in the relations uh, about seeing his first game. But there was a battle going on between the Jesuits and the Huron uh, faith keepers yeah. because the game uh, was, was had a uh, spiritual or religious background and the Jesuit fathers really didn't want that carried forward they, they wanted it to be under the church you know so this is up near Midland Ontario and uh, up in that area uh, where that 
all have. That's, I, I believe, as far as physical, tangible, that's the oldest we have. And it's, it's not much, but it's, we do have the that. Latest, yeah, that's the earliest written. There was some stuff in North Carolina written about a ball game of some sort in the 1500s, that, but not a terrible amount of information on that one. Yeah. I liken this exercise to imagine you're a, an archaeologist and you're spending an entire summer, 12 hours a day, looking for pottery shards. I mean, what conclusions do you draw from that? It's, it's a tough job. <laughs> I think that's the challenge with looking at ancient lacrosse. It's, it's that type of challenge. There's so little evidence. Yeah, the, that's it, why I emphasize the, the context. And the First Nations themselves didn't have written records. It was all oral tradition. You know, so you're relying on an oral tradition, and does that stay true to the, the first story you know, 300 years before, or does it modify or uh, you know, morph over, over that period of time? But That's it was why, oral tradition. And if you look at, a, if you look at say, the, the very old tradition of telling a story about the very first game played by winged creatures and four-legged creatures, which you know, it's, we look at that today as folklore, and, well, it's a really interesting story, actually. And what, what I would draw from this is, and I, I, I talk about this in my book and my other writings, that um, this speaks to the issue of how Native people feel it's very important that you emphasize inclusion. That this one creature got kind of kicked off his team and was adopted by the other team, and then they wound up winning. Uh, inclusion in a tribal society is very important. And it's also important to shun arrogance. And that's the lesson that I think you should take from that story. It's not whether there was an actual game taking place, it's what, what's behind that story. So if I'm, a, if I'm a storyteller, if I'm a faith keeper, whether it's the year 1600 or 2018, that's what you should be getting out of it. That inclusion matters. Don't be arrogant. Uh, it, there's only, our, our tribe, our town is very small. Everybody matters. Yeah, and everybody has a role to play. Yeah. Every, everyone has an importance. Uh, so in those medicine yeah. games that you might yeah. see being played in the late 20th century or today, uh, everybody plays. Yeah. Uh, young, old, everybody plays. Yeah. Everybody matters. Yeah. Uh, we got another question? Yeah. yeah. In terms of the growth of the game over the past, say, 30 years, what do, you, what do you think was the impact of guys, NHL stars like Gretzky and Shanahan and Newland Dyke, Adam Oates, coming out and advocating for, for the sport of lacrosse, basically saying, um, I'm, I'm such a good hockey player because of some of the things, the skills I learned in, in box lacrosse? I, I, I don't live in Canada, so I couldn't speak to that. Maybe, Jim, do you, do you know? Well, I, I think it was extremely important uh, to have that NHL connection. Because uh, everybody in Canada wanted their son to be uh, an NHL player. And uh, if there was something you could do that would add to your chances of getting to sure. the NHL. And then you see even today, everybody with the soft hands around the net is a, a lacrosse player you know, yeah. uh, in the NHL. And I remember I was kind of a different kind of Canadian because I, I grew up in the US and came back to Canada. Um, I was amazed at the connections with NHL personnel were so tight and close uh, even amongst the lacrosse community. Even we'll get into this in our next conversation, but even the '78 team, Gus McCauley was an NHL referee, uh, you know, and he was directly connected with the team. Ron Wicks uh, was like that. One of the tryouts that I went to as a young man, Adam Oates was on the field trying out for that team. It, it was very interesting to see. We didn't have that in the U.S. Right. That that close connection with the pro sports, you know. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't. My guess would be I don't think American young players today or. 30 years ago would make those connections at all. But I, but I would tell you that uh, the Gate brothers play a, an absolutely big role in stimulating high school lacrosse, inspiring kids in places like you know, upstate New York or, or elsewhere. That's very relevant. Gate brothers are, are we giants. Some, we some well, it's, a, it's interesting. You go to Wayne Gretzky's restaurant in, in uh, downtown Toronto, <laughs> and in the back there's trophy cases. And he's got one trophy case devoted to his... Uh, lacrosse uh, part of his life, you know. So he, that's how important he, he felt it was for him. I think, uh, you know, great session today. And I, Don, thank you so well, much for, for having me. coming Appreciate up here it. and you. speaking to everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>